I'm trying to get. I swore today I would not call Patrick Pierce again, but Vincent Carroll got the ball rolling today, so I will start with a quote. Misha Era, Marma Vrone, I am Ireland, great is my sorrow. Misha Era, Marma Nair, I am Ireland, great my shame. If Patrick Pierce was around today, I believe he'd probably add some lyrics to that. He'd probably write, Misha Era, more my Arag. I am Ireland. Great is my anger. Yeah. Look what you started now, Vincent. I just thought of this only a few moments ago. My way up to the Garden of Remembrance, I walked through Moor Lane. For anyone who doesn't know, Moor Lane is the uh, the uh, location, the iconic photograph of Patrick Pierce surrendering to uh, General Lowe. And he surrendered because of, as he put it, to uh, prevent the further slaughter of any more citizens. And I thought of the irony of why we're here today. We're here for the complete opposite. We're not here to surrender. We're here to push back against the slaughter of our citizens. I was in um, teaching my sixth class yesterday, Friday, about that man right in front of us there, Jim Larkin. Now he has his back to us at the moment, I hope that's not a sign, but uh, I was teaching him about the 1913 lockout, and I was showing him images of the Dublin streets. Uh, you might have seen them in the past. Masses of people running in all different directions while our, the uh, Dublin Metropolitan Police Force were beating them off the streets. I showed him the newspaper articles of two men killed by the police while they were fighting for their rights. And one of the children piped up and he put his hand up. He says, Moonshore, Moonshore, will this ever happen again? And I was being, I, I was honest with him. I said, yes, but it won't be about um, workers' rights. It's going to be about human rights. Human rights. And one of the children, this gave me great hope. One of the children, this is all honest, I swear to God. He said, he piped up straight away and he said, you mean like about the vaccine passports? The children are awake. I had five children yesterday come to me. See, nobody's listening to the children. Did Nobody's mentioned the children. Five children came to me yesterday, yesterday morning, because from Thursday night, it was when it was announced about uh, the masking of children in primary schools. And I'm 17 years teaching, and I recognize the look of concern and fear on a child. And I could see fear in their eyes and asking me, Moonshore, is this going to happen? We have to wear masks. And I said, no, not in my classroom. It won't happen. <laughs> Nothing to see here. And then, it was a marvelous day yesterday in school. I overheard a group of boys who were passionate about football and soccer and they were talking about their football and they said, one lad said, have you seen the amount of footballers who are dropping dead or having heart attacks? So I decided just to listen in a little bit closer and they kept talking yeah, and they were naming off the players, naming what uh, leagues, European leagues they were playing in and one of them says, why is it happening all of a sudden? And to which there was a little lull of silence. And you could see them thinking. And I was praying that nobody would come over and interrupt me or ask me a question. Until one child piped up and he said, it has to be the vaccine. Yeah. Our children are awake. Yeah. But the adults aren't, unfortunately. And that both inspires me and frightens me at the same time. Helena mentioned a few minutes ago about singing. Currently in our schools, children are prohibited from singing. They are prohibited from learning tin whistle. They are pr prohibited. School choirs are prohibited. Well, it depends if you comply or not. But in general, most schools and most children in this country cannot sing and play tin whistle and be part of a choir. Yet, their teachers of a Thursday night can ram and squeeze themselves into copper face jacks and exchange bodily fluids with whomever they choose to. 
Not that I have an issue with that. It's more with the fact we have different rules for children, okay? For our children. And I take that very, very, very personally. Um, Dr. Marguerite uh, uh, Grish Brisson, she's a German neurologist. I'm sure Dr. Vincent uh, Carroll would be able to explain this a lot better than I can. I'm trying, I've printed off research studies, a pile this thick. I recently put out a request on the IOL um, Telegram group. Send me as many studies as you can give me about the damage of masks. I have them, I know how dangerous they are for children, but I want as many as I can. This thick! A pile. And that's going on my principal's desk, if needs be. And it will be sent to my board of management. <laughs> Dr. Brige, or Dr. Grige Brisson has said it's an absolute no-no to mask children. Children's brains are more active than adults. The more active your brain, the more oxygen it requires. Masks categorically are going to damage our children's brain development and their learning, full stop, bottom line. Do not allow it in your classrooms, teachers. We say no. 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 And here's a little lesson. Since we're teachers here, we'll teach Norma Foley a lesson, who's apparently a teacher herself. A group of Belgian, Belgian doctors last year got together, just of their own accord, and they wrote to their, um, health, their health minister to request, do not mask children, for all the reasons we just explained. Do not mask them. The minister, the Flemish minister for education, listened. And he decided children in schools will not wear masks anymore in Belgium. I don't know if it's the whole of Belgium or this particular region. They do not wear masks. And he, this is why he explained it. He said he balanced basically the risk between potential spread of COVID and against the disadvantages of children wearing masks. And he said, even if there's a doubt, where there's doubt, give children the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> uh, common sense. So Norma Foley. Norma Foley, daughter, daughter of Dennis Ansbacker Foley, let's not forget. It's time to redeem your family name and follow the example of the Flemish Minister for Education. There's a lovely little buzzword I just want to tell you about in education at the moment, a lot of you won't know about it. It's called pupil voice. It's a lovely little word that schools like to use. Pupil voice. Pupil voice. In other words, listening to children. So, for example, student councils all over the country have been set up. Okay. The UN, the Convention of the Rights of the Child, states that, and it's, state, it's written in their charter, whenever decisions are being made about children that affects them, children should have a say in what goes on. Okay. So I say to every school in the country, if you have a student council now, scrap it get rid of it okay because you do not respect pupil voice if you are going to mass children's scrap it now it's a tokenistic gesture if you're going to listen to children listen to them and ask them do they want to wear masks in classrooms we all know the answer to that simple teachers I've called several times on teachers to please Please stand up now. Pupil voice is not being listened to. Parent voice is not being listened to. You are the voice now. You are on the inside and you can speak out. You can speak out now. And what I say to them is, I'm calling all teachers here, including my colleagues here in the Irish Education Alliance. This is what you need to do if this is made mandatory in classrooms. Because I'm going to do it. On my own time, I before nine o'clock in the morning on my own time and on a public pathway outside my, outside my school I will have a placard and I will warn parents of the dangers of wearing masks and when that bell goes at nine o'clock into my classroom and I will not enforce the wearing of masks that's all you need to do teachers and you will be shunned and you'll probably be 
abused by some parents, that's fine. As Vincent Carroll reminded us, that's what happened to the men and women in 1916, the march of those doors. The vilification, the ostracization they suffered and the abuse. That's us. We're going to have to take it. Suck it up, folks. We're going to have to take it, but it'll prove right in the end. Please stick with it. Parents. Parents, I know this is very hard. And you've done wonderful work till now, sending emails, letters. But now it's time to maneuver. When I say maneuver, you need to do the same thing. In groups of two, three, four, five. It doesn't matter. Outside schools with your placards, warning against a warning of the dangers of children wearing masks, knocking on principals' doors, asking to speak to them. You've got to maneuver now. It's your physical presence that's required. Your sentiments are worthless now at this stage. It's physical presence that's required. So I call on parents and teachers to show a physical presence now against this. Yes. I'll finish up now, folks, just to say that it's time for a radical overhaul of our education system, a radical overhaul. I sat down last night and I took out um, one of Pierce's books. It's, uh, he wrote an article called The Murder Machine in 1912, and he used the term murder machine to refer to British educational system in Ireland, the murder machine. And I have to say, if he's alive today, and from reading what I read, reminded myself of there is nothing different today than from 1912 until with our education system we were turning out little minions for industry that's all we're doing for globalists um, to exploit for their purpose for economic purposes we don't teach our children the constitution it's not on the curriculum we don't teach them about their rights we don't teach children critical thinking skills how can we, when our teachers don't have critical thinking skills, apart from my good colleagues here? I'll just give you a quick quote, what Pierce wrote in 1912, and the fact, I know we hear people, oh, he was way ahead of his time, 20 years, 30 years. How in God's name can you be 110 years ahead of your time? But Patrick Pierce was, and what he said was, what Ireland needs is a new bird of the heroic spirit. The task of fostering once again knightly courage and strength and truth. And then we should have at least the beginning of an education system. How apt is that today, folks? Well, written in 1912, what's that, 109 years ago? I swore to God I wasn't going to use this quote again, but I don't care now. I'm going to finish with this quote again. Blame Vincent Carroll again. And it's a warning shot to the government and the people out there who aren't listening, especially who aren't listening to the likes of Kevin Quinn, who I thought was just absolutely marvellous listening to him there. How brave a man he is. So this goes out to Neffet, it goes out to the government, it goes out to the media, it goes out to everybody who's trying to, everyone, Fauci, the lot, okay, and again it's taken from Patrick Pierce's poem, The Rebel, and it goes, beware, beware of the thing that is coming, beware of the risen people who shall take what ye would not give. Did ye think to conquer the people, or that law is stronger than life, or that men's desire to be free? We will try it out with you, ye that have harried and held, ye that have bullied and bribed, tyrants, hypocrites, liars! Go and meet him, my good.